Um, the elephant, I'll tell you a really quick story about the elephant. Um, after he's, you know, I did the elephant, he turns into the elephant, which is fun. That secret, when just the yeah. trunk goes out in the ears, that was just really fun. And then he walks in the parade, got to do that. That was fun. Kicks the door open. That was fun. And then after that, you don't see him. He's the elephant and he, he can't, he can't go anywhere anymore. He's stuck. Right? So there's a scene of Aladdin and uh, in the genie kind of in the jungle and they're talking about Jasmine. And there's a boo as the elephant stuck in the corner and he's, you know, and so John says, just have him, he said, just keep him alive. Just have him breathing or looking or just something subtle. And I'm thinking, damn it. And he's like, you need, he's not even in the movie anymore. So I was trying to think of something to come, a thing to come up with where he would do something. I want to keep him in the movie, you know? So I had an idea of, I said, John, I had this idea. What if he still thinks he's a monkey? And he's trying to peel bananas and he's just always he, but he's got this that hands he's just got these hooves or whatever those elephant feet are called and he's just squishing the banana and throwing the bananas over his shoulder and there's a pile of bananas off to the side and john said okay yeah that's funny do that so i went to, back to my desk and i started to do but it was a little like this mm -hmm. and then i saw but then john told me he says no 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 what we're gonna make that a scene we're gonna cut to that so do it big we're going to make that actually a gag in the movie. So do them big and do all your, and then we're going to we'll pan over and there'll be a bunch of banana skins over on the thing. Anyway, so that that's what happened. And so when you see the movie, the only reason that him peeling bananas is because I had to try to come up with some way to keep him in the movie because he wasn't hardly in it anymore. Anyway, that's being invested in your character. So, Hey guys, it's your host, Julian. This week, I sit down with veteran animator Rick Farmelow. During the chat, we talk of the early days of Shrek and it won in the Oscar, Bob Clampett and his major impact on Rick's career, Aladdin, Robin Williams is the genie, the best genie, my favorite actor. Oh, it was such a touching story, the one he brings up, and so much more. If you folks are enjoying this podcast, leave us a five-star rating on your favorite podcast platform. It helps us out tremendously. Thanks for listening, and I hope you enjoy the show. Rick, man, welcome to the show. How are hey. you? Thank you, Julian. Good. It's good to be here. Thanks. Oh man, I'm, I'm, I've been looking forward to this one for quite some time. Uh, you know, when I put out the little teaser on uh, asking for fan input, I did not realize the level of questions that would be tailored towards two movies. Really, uh, mm -hmm. well, Shrek was really big, and then uh, another one was um, your your Disney career as well. Uh, a lot of people cool. wanted to know about Aladdin. A lot of people wanted to know about right. Shrek. Right. And I had just had uh, Mr. Tom Cito on not too long ago. Uh, phenomenal cool. guest. And yeah, very, very dear friend of mine. Oh, he's such a like listening to him talk like there was points. Well, you don't time. have a choice. You don't get to talk. You just listen. When he starts, you just sit back and get out a cigar and just listen. That's what I that's what I loved about having him on because like sometimes depending on the guest I have on, sometimes you kind of gotta drag some stuff out of him uh or her. No, and Tom, then, you gotta push it back in. <laughs> well, it, I love that because it makes my job easy. And there are plenty of times where he would stop talking. I'm like, oh, this is where I'm supposed to ask him something else, or this is where I'm supposed to progress the conversation along a little bit. But it's so fascinating because I've had a couple historians on and nobody I don't want to say nobody goes into detail like Tom, but Tom goes into detail, but he breaks it down. I'm not a very smart guy, but Tom breaks it down to a level where I can understand and I can associate it with yeah. other things, but he's also bringing in all of these outside factors that are going on and then yeah. he's making it applicable to the topic. So I he's find that really, so he's, he's the, he's the best at that. I mean, ever since I've known him, he's been a real history buff and mm -hmm. he knows so much about so many things and he loves just talking about it and, yeah. you know, his, sharing his knowledge. And it's, you know, he's, it's fascinating. You're never bored when you're with him. Absolutely so, not. Yeah. I mean, I can only imagine. Uh, but the only reason I bring him up, man, is because uh, we did a, I, I let all the fans um, decide on what we were going to talk about as far as Tom's episode goes. And everybody wanted to know about Shrek. I didn't realize yeah. that we're such a huge and rabid fan base for Shrek, man. So when they yeah. saw you were coming on and they knew you were working on Shrek, it went pretty crazy with the Shrek questions, man. So I got to. Cool. We'll okay. take it back just for a few, man. When do you kind of get the call for Shrek? Say, hey, DreamWorks is putting this movie out. We would like for you to work on the show or this movie. Well, well, I was already at DreamWorks mm -hmm. before Shrek was actually a production. I mean, I was hired there. I left Disney. I went to another studio and then I was going to go back to Disney. And Jeffrey Katzenberg started DreamWorks and he called me and said, hey, why don't you come over and see what we're doing here? And they were doing the Prince of Egypt. And he said, if you come here, you can do a 
You can be a supervising animator. You can do story. You can do character designs, all these things. Anyway, so I thought, wow, this is a great opportunity. So I, so I went to DreamWorks and there's like maybe 10 people there when I started, but it was for Prince of Egypt. And then Shrek was in development all the time we were doing Prince of Egypt, but it never could get any traction. There's different things happen. I mean, Chris Farley passed away, yeah. who was the original voice. It just seemed to never really get traction. And then, I mean, they went through so many teams of directors before they got to Vicky and Andrew. Um, and I was doing animation. I was animating on, on um, Prince of Egypt. Then I went on to Road to El Dorado. Uh, and then what happened was I started doing story on El Dorado. I had a lot of these ideas you know, uh, for the film and different ways to do things. And so Jeffrey was impressed with that and said, you need to get into story. And I said, well, I don't really want to move out of animation into story. He kept bugging me to get into story. So finally he said, you are getting into story. That's it. You're going to, you're, you're going to stop this. And no one's going to care about your animation, get into story. Anyway. So I got into, that's what happened is I, I joined Shrek, the Shrek team in the story development phase, but there had already pretty much, the film had pretty much already turned into what you what everybody saw by then. It had taken a turn. And when it became a parody of fairy tales, that was the that was what turned it around. That's what um, so I was there about that time when it made that turn and it turned into this this parody of fairy tales and it kind of really took off. Yeah, taken off is like an understatement. This movie blew up here. So there's two things I want to circle back to before I derailed it there with a little bit of NBA talk. Um, <laughs> but uh, one, I, I would love to know because his name's come up a few times. And whenever names like this come up that I absolutely love hearing about, uh, I like to explore just a little bit. Jeffrey Katzenberg. You got a favorite Jeffrey Katzenberg story? Wow, a favorite story. Um, or, if, or if when that name, when you hear that name, does anything come to well, mind? Well, I, I love Jeffrey. He He, like I said, he sort of wooed me to go and go and go to dreamworks everything he promised me mm -hmm. he delivered on every yeah. single thing that he said i could do i did and um because i was writing a lot of story notes on things we got to be pretty close like at disney he was kind of a little bit distant with a lot of us yeah um but at dreamworks he was a little more he was a little more inviting and a little more friendly, a little more, you have more one-on-one -on -one with him. I, so I got to, because I had funny, I had funny gag ideas. I'd be invited to screenings of either the a film I was on or other films I wasn't on just to um, come up with comedy ideas and gag ideas and that kind of stuff. And I'd write all the stuff down and send it to him. He'd call me and, you know, he, on the weekends, he'd call me. It's just this back and forth thing. So I got to be, you know, pretty close to him. And uh, I really, really respect him. He yeah. turned Disney animation around. Absolutely. Um, he, I don't think he's given nearly enough credit for that. But he, his, his high standard of excellence was to basically don't, I don't want good enough. I want great. And until it's great, I don't want to see it. So he just, he made us believe we could be better than we thought we could be. And that's something I'm always going to remember. And even things, that, it's something I still carry with me today. So, and Jeffrey's also one of these guys who he is, he loves, he, relationships are important to him. I can send him an email about something. Hey, Jeffrey, I heard blah, 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 blah. Within 10 minutes, I get a response. That's really cool. And he's always been that way. And I just, I have, <laughs> I have nothing good thing to say about him. And I really respect him. I'm, I, I miss not working with him anymore. Um, I'm trying to think of a favorite story. One thing that was really, this isn't a really a, a, a crazy story, but um, we were at DreamWorks and we were up upstairs and this is during Shrek and he had a bunch of laundry that was, went out to the cleaners. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I, I was, I was fascinated by this one thing. Anyway, he got everything back and it was all in boxes. Every sweater and every shirt was in a separate box. It had a little ribbon around it. And as he was talking to us about the movie, he was opening the boxes, taking the shirt or sweater out and refolding it <laughs> and then putting it back in the box. Every single shirt and pullover sweater he would take out of the box and, you know, do the, the, the arms of the sweater, refold it, put it back in the paper, you know, and in the box, put the lid on the box, do another one. He was like, you know, such a perfectionist, yes. you know. I mean, OCD, whatever, but um, it was just really fascinating 
to see him do that. So, I mean, he was a really, a real attention to de detail kind of person. Right. Yeah. And he was also, he was also very, he's open to, you know, if you want to talk to him, he'd make time for you. He, mm -hmm. you know, you'd schedule it. He'd give you whatever, 20 minutes, whatever, you know, you need, but he was always available. Yeah. And so I just, I just always have always really respected him. And I think he stands for excellence. Other people have other stories about him, opinions about him and stuff, which is they're valid, but I'm just telling you from my experience, I just yeah. really have a lot of respect for the man. And I feel very lucky to have worked for him. That's really cool. Cause I've heard a lot of great stories about him one day. I'm hoping to have him on man. Cause like I said, there's a few people that have really pushed innovation when it comes to animation. He's up yeah. there. I mean, yeah. him, you know, uh, the, the, you know, Eisner up there, you, you got all these folks that have taken the torch that Walt kind of set and has tried to progress it further and further and pushed animation right. to its limits. So right. I really appreciate stories like this. Um, yeah, cool. One second. All right. And another thing I wanted to circle back to was uh, Jeffrey kind of wanting to push you into story. Did he ever tell you why, or do you have a feeling why he wanted you in story? He just thought I was, he had thought I had good ideas. Mm -hmm. He'd call me up and say, Hey, Chief, so these are really good ideas. What, how, can, how can we make them work? How can we make these things work? And I go, well, you know, this, well, in this sequence, you could have this happen, this happen. So he just, you know, it was that kind of thing. Um, and he just kept inviting me to other st story sessions or other films. Mm -hmm. Mostly my ideas were funny. I just was a gag. And even at Disney, I was used in that way. I would be called in to come up with gag ideas and do a comedy pass on a film that maybe could use some more humor, you know? Um, so he just was, very, he was very uh, encouraging is the best word I can like. He just wanted me to do more and more of it. Yeah. And he's like, no one's going to miss your animation. <laughs> he says, <laughs> I said, thank you. So he said, just get, and I buy that on El Dorado, by the time I was in all in El Dorado, I was really getting kind of a little bit burnt out. So Prince of Egypt was a lot of work. El Dorado was a lot of work. And I just like, wow, I, story just seemed like something different. Like this is, maybe I need to do this for a while. So I, it wasn't that he, that he forced me. I mean, I, I, at first I didn't really want to leave animation, but he kind of made, made me realize you might be more valuable in story. So I, that's why I moved into story for, for Shrek. And then I worked on a, uh, a tortoise in the hair. It was going to be a film with Ardman. It's going to be a stop motion film with Ardman, but that got shelled. And there's another film I was working on with these kangaroos that got shelled. So things just, we ran out of projects after a while, but, but initially I, I was on Shrek. So. Did you get the same kind of fulfillment? Like obviously you said you were getting burnt out, but did you get the same kind of fulfillment and story that you did while animating or. I don't in general, um, even though I've done boards and I, I don't mind. I don't, I should, I said, when I say I don't mind doing boards, that sounds kind of flippant. Like, oh, I don't mind doing boards. I, I'm okay. I'm, I don't think I'm that great at, like I do them and they, they work, mm -hmm. but I think I'm way more comfortable. And I think my, uh, I do the best work when I'm animating. Mm -hmm. um, I don't really do boards anymore. I can still do them if I need to. I can do boards on my own stuff or if somebody wants me to do some boards, I can do them. But as far as that's my job on a production that I don't, I don't go for that anymore. I don't seek that out anymore just because I don't feel it's my strong suit. I mean, I think all animators can do boarding to some extent. And we had, you know, we all kind of learned learned it. I think at Disney, we would do thumb, little tiny thumbnails of get a gag idea. We'd thumbnail it out and do these little storyboards and stuff. So I got, I knew how to do that. But as far as like throwing myself into a whole film and thinking visually and, you know, dealing with perspective and camera moves and all that, it's just, it's just a little more technical than, a, than I want to give a lot of time to. So to me, animating is what I feel is my calling, what I've always done best. So that's why I have pretty much moved back into doing animation exclusively. Hey there, I'm Isaiah and welcome to my channel, 47 Cartoon Guy, a channel dedicated to all things animation and nostalgia. I do retrospectives, short comedic videos, and remember videos. If I can get away with it, that is. I have many videos dedicated to some of my favorite animation properties, such as nostalgic lookbacks on Cartoon Network's Golden Age, and also videos focusing on Scooby-Doo, one of my favorite cartoons of all time. 
In my most recent series, The Fantastic Legacy of Hanna-Barbera, dives into the history of the legendary animation studio and its founders. If you love my videos, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and click the bell icon so you'll know when I have a new video up. And also consider donating to my Patreon, where you can support the channel and get early access to videos, behind the scenes pics, and even view exclusive future remember videos. Thanks for watching and I hope to see you soon. Until next time, I'm 47 Cartoon Guy and I gotta fly. Do you remember where or how you fell in love with animation or you knew this is what you wanted to do for a living? Well, I was, I was really little and I saw Pinocchio. Mm. Um, and I think it was 1962 because I have a movie poster from 19, I found the whatever years that it was re-released yeah, re I realized it was 1962 so I went on was five or six years old and I saw it at the drive-in and I just it was just fascinating like I'd watch tv cartoons but they weren't like this you know and I just was like I don't even know what that is called or how to do it, but I, that's what I want to do I want to sort of do that so I remember going home and making my own Pinocchio book just doing drawings and making my own little from what I could remember from the film so it just fascinated me from that from that standpoint and then the year after that Sword in the Stone came out and I remember going to see that in a movie theater also and just the colors and just it was just fascinating to me and I just it was just like wow you know again I didn't know what it was called but I wanted to do that you know so everything from that point on I just drew cartoons and not that I was always animating because I was too little to know how to animate but I would draw cartoons mm -hmm. so I was grew up loving peanuts and Charles Schultz so he was a very early influence and Walt Disney of course but Sparky was a really real huge influence I mean I get to meet him later on and we became friends and he everything he stood for I just I was like I want to be like that guy you know <laughs> And then there's a lot of other people I met also. I mean, Bob Clampett um, was a huge, huge, huge influence on me, huge mentor. We had somebody um, we had somebody write in about Bob, and I'm so glad you brought up Charles. Schultz. I'll bring. I'll talk. I'll talk all day about Bob. No problem. I don't know if you can see it, but uh, I've got old Snoopy and Woodstock, yeah. and and That's then awesome. uh, got old Charlie right there. I'm a huge, uh, huge sorry. Peanuts fan. I actually had um, the uh, fuck. What, what is he? Is the Blankens so bad right now he's the curator for the Schultz Museum Benjamin Percy um Benjamin Percy no it's Benjamin I just can't remember his last name Benjamin I'm so sorry but I had the curator for the Schultz Museum on I had so many fascinating stories about the Charles Schultz and I just had um Great. Bob's daughter Ruth Clampett on a few months know, back and, oh she's the greatest oh man she was so cool and I, I didn't realize until I started talking to her this, she comes on the screen kind of like everybody else does on the screen on zoom and shit you pop in and you're looking like oh what do you got in the background there right so i see over her right shoulder it was the great piggy bank robbery right and yeah. i was I'm, i've been i was dreaming about that sequence where daffy's standing there all of the villains are standing over i've been dreaming about that oh, sequence yeah. for uh, weeks and for the yeah. life of me i could not remember the name i couldn't remember anything other than i knew it was daffy and i was and I, I was like before we hit record what is the name of that cartoon because i've had dreams about that scene i've had dreams of those colors just yeah. like i've got goosebumps now but it's just yeah. I had dreams of that i was like what is that and she smiled and she told me the story about bob coming to san diego comic-con and telling the entire like just showing that cartoon yeah. he was and, he was such he was such a genius and that is one of the all-time greatest cartoons ever yes. made. Um, it's my favorite for sure. That one, I love my two favorite cartoons of all time, Great, Pig, Great Piggy Bank Robbery and Kitty Corner, mm -hmm. which he did around the same time. And they're just, his imagination was unlike anybody else who ever directed cartoons. He just had this incredible, crazy imagination. And a lot of stuff didn't make any sense, but it did. When you saw it, it kind of made sense. It didn't make logical sense, but it, emotionally it made sense. Yeah. And no one before or since has ever done that. And I just like, you know, he just, he's just like, you know, I knew him, you know, um, met him in 1979 and became friends with him and the whole, all the Clampets they were just all wonderful. They still are. Um, but just, he was such a, uh, unassuming person. He, yeah. he doesn't, he didn't have crazy thoughts and he didn't, you know, he wasn't flamboyant. He just was a very sort of, quiet funny charming friendly guy and like how did that stuff come from your head I and mean, how did you come up with that you know and you know he had a great team of story artists with him that helped but man that guy's imagination was just 
literally out of this world. Yes. And you can watch those cartoons over and over and over and over again. And you're always going to find something else. Oh, I didn't notice that before. Mm -hmm. uh, even if it's a frame that's different than from what you remember. I used to stop frame those. I said, the little, there were super eight movies, you know, and then go to the editor and watch every single frame and go, what is he thinking? How did he do that? Or what? But it works. Everything worked, you know? So yeah, I, he's one of my major heroes. Yeah. Yeah. I, like I said, I, it just realizing after talking to her that that's probably one of my earliest memory of a cartoon is that like, there's, I mean, it's, it's, it might be something else, but like when I sit here and really, because what happened was after I got done talking to her, we talked for almost two hours wow. and I was pumped. Like I, like usually after a conversation, you know, when I have people on, I don't want to say you're drained, but to an extent you're like, oh man, I'm, I'm level. Right. So I come from a kitchen where it's go, 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 go. Adrenaline's always pumping, always pushing. Right. And then you come and you talk to people and you're trying to manage your energy. So you're not like, ah, like all over the place and shit. Right. So everything seems like a normal, like I seem like a normal person. Right. But after having that conversation with her, I was at such a fucking high, like yeah. I'm outside and usually I'm a one to one and a half joint kind of guy at night, right? Go outside. I like to watch the bats. I sit in my rocking chair and I just watch the bats eat and shit. That night was a three fucking joint night. I watched you, where, that. Where do you live? Transylvania? Where's, where, are these, where are these bats? I, I live in Florida. So I live oh, in Orlando. Florida. Well, there's, those could be big mosquitoes, you know. I'm glad they're not. Be, <laughs> well, I've got, we've got this thing. It's called a skeeter heater. And you just put these little things in and it, it pops uh it puts out like waves or some shit like it puts out the citronella shit so it keeps them away uh -huh. um, but the, the bats are massive and I, I love seeing them around because they're eating the mosquitoes um sure. and I, fuck, I hate mosquitoes oh, they're yeah, they're they suck they suck so yeah. bad bastards yeah. really um but i'm sitting out there and then i this is the only time i'd ever done this with an episode but i i, I take these episodes i put them on google drive and then i take those and then my editor gets them so I'm sitting there, I upload it to the drive and I'm just watching it. And then I pause it when we started talking about the piggy bank, probably it's fairly early in it. So I watched it and I watched it and I watched it. And I realized, like I said, I'm three joints in and I'm like, what the fuck is going on? And usually three joints is enough to put me down for quite some time, but I, I don't know what it was. It was just the stimulating conversation. It was learning so much about her dad and realizing like, without that, I don't know what I'm into at that point. I don't know if I'm into cartoons the way I am now. I don't know if I seek out animation the way I seek out. If it wasn't for Bob Clamp, if it wasn't for her dad, having that talk with her and having all of these crazy things go on, it's just wild to think how one little thing can spider web, right? And then you get trace and you can trace everything back to that one moment, I guess is really what I'm getting at. So it was just a wild conversation. I really appreciated that one. That was one of my favorite ones I've ever had. Um, so no pressure, Rick, is what I'm telling you. Um, so. <laughs> <laughs> but I digress, man. So let's get back on track here. So um, you're on Shrek, right? You're into story. Um, did you, I asked the same question to Tom when he was on, did you get to have any kind of interaction with Chris before he passed? No, we never no. met. I don't think anybody did. I mean, he, he, I think he remotely did the voice, did the voice recording. I don't think yeah. he was in town to do it. Um, but I remember watching a test. Mm -hmm. It was a hand, a 2d test, hand-drawn test of him talking about the onions. It's a, it's, it's life is like an onion. It's many layers. Blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And Dale bear, who was a brilliant animator did a test with that, with Chris's vocal. And we all thought it was great. You know, and at the time, I, I think we weren't sure if Shrek was going to be a 2D film or, or CG. Um, but he did this really great test. It was with Chris's voice. And then, of course, he passed away suddenly. And we were all, a lot of us were like, you know what, this is maybe this is a sign that maybe this film is not meant to happen because we had, you know, I wasn't I was again, I was on Prince of Egypt, but we'd always know what was happening with Shrek. And it just seemed like they couldn't get any traction. They tried different teams of directors and no one was able to really figure that thing out. And it was like a 10 page book anyway. So we were like, what is it? What is it about this property that Jeffrey sees so much potential in? Because it's the book is kind of, eh, you know, it's fine. It's a fine book. It's fun, but it, the whole feature. So we were all, a lot of us, oh, just this is a sign. You need to just, this is, but let it go. You know, let, let this, let this uh, production go. And uh, he didn't, and he got Mike Myers to come on. And Mike at first was doing a, an imitation of Chris, just trying to sign just like Chris. 
And then it was, he decided, you know what, I'll just need to do my own version of it. And then he did his version and man, he was great. Oh, he was yeah. absolutely great. And, our, and the, then I said, and of course, later on, all of a sudden we hit this, um, this turning point where the story turned into a, it was the, the uh, gingerbread man, muffin man um, <laughs> sequence. And I wish I could remember everybody's name, Chris Miller and Cody Cameron and All Conrad right. Vernon is the, is the other guy. Those three guys came up with this, let's just have fun, do something weird, do a parody of, of a fairy tale here. And they did that. And Jeffrey saw that and said, that's my movie. Mm. That's what the movie is. The movie is, movie is a parody of fairy tales. And, and once that happened, everything just fell into place. Anyway, <laughs> uh, you were asking me about Chris Farley, but yeah, anyway, so no, no uh, I don't know. I don't think any of us actually met him. He never came to the studio that I know. No, this is very early on again. Yeah. At DreamWorks, you know, I think he recorded wherever he lived, you know, remotely. That makes sense, man. Yeah. Um, uh, with, with something like Shrek, I, I try to I try to associate something with something I've seen before, but before Shrek, there was really nothing like Shrek, right? Nope. See, I mean, you can kind of take like it was an animated version of SNL. It was a parody, right? Like we were saying, it was a parody. That's what it kind of feels like now where you, you start. I love going back now and I get hit on this on almost every episode. Every episode I've ever brought up backgrounds, I get hit on from the fans because they're like, man, you spend way too much time on backgrounds. But I absolutely love looking in the background because uh, were you ever a comic book fan or do you read comic books or anything like that? No, oh, man, I'm one of those rare people in animation who is not into comic books. No. <laughs> I probably have four. One of them is Batman from 1966. You know, they did yeah. a, a, a version of the Batman show. For, there's a, I have a Bill Lugosi comic. I mean, I'm just not, I mean, I definitely appreciate those guys. Yeah. And I've met a lot of them. And I love their work and I love Frank Frazetta. I love Jack Davis. I love um, um, Mort Drucker. Those aren't real, when you're talking about comic books, those are not real comic book guys. Those yeah. are mad magazine guys. Those are the guys I love. This yeah. is, is the mad guys, the mad cartoonists, not the superhero. I got Although you. I love Jack Kirby, brilliant. You know, I love all the, I know who those guys are and I really respect them. I love their work and man, it's amazing. But as far as me being a huge, huge fan of that, I just never really, you know, I just, it just never really hit me that way. Oh man, that's all right. The only reason I bring that up is because there's a, uh, I've brought it up so many times. I really feel like I should have stock in this company. <laughs> I should at least, you know, get one of these guys on. I can't, is that the first? No, it's not the first volume. First volumes are on here somewhere, but there's this comic book right here. It's called Chew. Uh huh. Right. So it's about a, uh, a detective that is a Chibo path. And what a Chibo path is, is this guy can literally eat something. So say he's eating a cheeseburger. He eats a bite. So think of dead zone, right? The show dead zone back in the day. Mm -hmm. So he eats, eats a cheeseburger and he's like, Oh shit, this, this, I can know, I know where this cow was butchered. I know where this cow was killed and how he was oh, killed. Wow. And then he also gets his thing. Like say somebody does something fucked up. Right. So the guy that is butchering this cow cuts his finger, his blood gets into the meat that he's eating. He knows that the guy that butchered this cow killed somebody three States over. Right. So it's oh, a wow. very weird, you have to suspend disbelief, but you work in animation. So that's yeah. you have to suspend <laughs> disbelief for a lot of things. Right. Yeah. So this, this, uh, this comic book, it forced me to look in the background because I'm flipping through the panel or I'm flipping through the pages on the first volume decades or a decade ago now at this point. And I see this little kid and he's out there. They're two cops. So they're outside of this convenience store. And then the one cop was a dick to the clerk. Right. So the, he's just giving this clerk a real hard time. The clerk's like 16 years old. So as I'm flipping it, I see in the bottom panel of the clerk going like this to the cop and the cop doesn't see it because his back is facing him. So I think that was where my fixation on backgrounds have been. It's just, it mm, forces okay. me to look. So now that I've seen Shrek for so long, I mean, Shrek's been out for 21 years now at this point. Um, I, I force myself to listen to the movie, but watch the background to see like what I can pull. Like you right. see Burger King, you know, see Burger King parody. You see all of these yeah. things, Taco Bell, you see all of these crazy things. Yeah. Do you guys remember, or do you remember, I know it's a long time ago, but do you remember if there was a, a, a conscious effort to say, let's see what we can get in here. And did you guys we ever do have, that all we do that all the time. We've done yeah. it for years. I mean, when I would do a scene when I was at Disney and there'd be like a bunch of characters, I'd put my kids in the 
new characters and my kid and stick them in there. Oh, that's cool. do that. In Little Mermaid, there's the opening shot of the pirate ship. And that's not a pirate ship, it's the ship. And Eric is on the ship and there's all the, the deck hands. And there's all, those are all guys you worked with, story guys and layout guys. They're caricatures of them. We have done that for years. You stick in little things and maybe no one's going to notice. And we do that all the time. You do little, I put, I put Mr. Limpet in. I did a, a, I did a few scenes of Sebastian. I, Scuttle was my character, but I did a few scenes of Sebastian, including the Under the Sea, mm -hmm. where he's conducting underwater and then all the fish surround him. And he's, he's I forget what he says. I'm gonna, someone's got to nail that girl's fins to the floor. And he, as I said, and all the fish are around him and stuff. Some of them are, there's Mr. Limpet. I put, you know, I'd put character, you know, characters in there that I wonder if anybody's, anybody's going to notice. Just, fr just fun stuff like that. So we've been doing that forever. So is there one that you've slipped, like maybe somebody hasn't come up to you and asked about that, that you can think of? Anything come to mind? I mean, I didn't have a lot of crowd scenes, so I never, I didn't have the opportunities to, and I didn't work in backgrounds, so I never did that. But um, I can't think of anything that that you know that anybody has asked me about or like, yeah. hey, did you do that? You know, whatever. I mean, there's that scene. There's the famous in the first rescuers of the naked girl. Yeah. As they're going, you know, there's two frames of this topless girl in one of the windows of the of the building that you can only see if you stop frame it. Yeah. Um, now that was just somebody. Somebody did that. Nobody will ever notice. No one ever did notice until. They put out the film in a super eight home movie version and people were like looking at it frame by frame with their editors and like whoa what did i just see you know so and then they were busted you know and then disney when they put the video out at first they didn't do any they just put the video out right yeah. and then all of a sudden they realized what was in yeah. there yeah so then they recalled all the videos and they you know blacked it out and stuff it's crazy but anyway that's kind of probably the most famous example of somebody sticking something in there just for fun and no one ever noticed it but then years later they did so there was uh one of my favorite stories i've, I've ever heard of somebody trying to sneak something into a background uh, i had him on a couple weeks ago his name is brad abelson he was a, a storyboard artist for the simpsons and he just got done co-directing the minions movie that just dropped a couple weeks ago um so when he was on the simpsons one of his first one of his first things is i think he was saying it was he was bart was playing the claw machine so in the they he was like what do i what do i do and he was like well just draw a bunch of shapes like a bunch of toys and stuff like that so he decided to draw a big wiener and a nut sack and <laughs> corner so what happened was is it got all the way to korea because they were doing all of the cell animation in right. korea yeah yeah right yeah. so he's it's literally getting i think he said it was either getting ready to get painted or it was painted and then one of the animators was like hold on here so he was like hey boss come over here so his boss talked to his boss his boss talked to his boss and then the head of korea for paint and cells was contacting fox and he's like yeah. Dude, what the fuck is going on why is there a dick and a wiener or why is there a dick and balls yeah. in this in this thing and he's like oh shit and he was like uh, i can't remember who he said i want to say it was probably mark kirkland and maybe it was tim bailey i can't remember who he said but he's like he really put his he really put his neck out on the line for me he's like hey man he's young he's 18 years old this is his first yeah. job in animation he, yeah you know we were we were pushing the envelope type of thing yeah so yeah. It, it was just really cool to see what people can and what people do sneak in there because i think it's i fun. worked i worked with brad on something um he we did a pilot it uh what was in it it didn't go but i was doing boards for him i was i was at bento box doing boards for a show called uh, border town uh it was only on for one season it was really funny but anyway and i think and brad was there and he was gonna do a pilot for kumar and something it was uh, those two guys saved the world i forget oh, who uh they were. yeah um gosh ah, shit here oh, fuck we're so good but i have such a great memory anyway it's, yeah. you know what i'm talking about but there was yeah. going to be you did a pilot Harold and kumar. Harold and kumar yeah yeah we did i think i said some boards for him on that brad's he was a really good dude i liked working with him it didn't the, the show didn't go but it was fun to, to work with him for a little bit yeah we just sat here and broed it for like two hours because the edibles oh, great did. The edibles kicked in about 20 minutes into it. And my eyes go, yeah. oh shit, this is going to be one of two things. And he was, he was so fucking fun, man. Yeah, um, but, dude. oh, really is, man. Uh, yeah. But, um, so getting back to Shrek here, man. Uh, so Shrek, obviously it's a juggernaut 
right out of the, I don't want to say right out of the gate, but it was right out of the gate. It was a juggernaut. Did you guys have a sense or a feeling when you guys are working on this? Like, man, this is going to be the next thing, or was it just a job at that? You never, you never know that. You never, you 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 just, you just try to make a good movie. Mm -hmm. And I think we felt like this was a good movie. I mean, I felt the same way as Little Mermaid and a lot of them where you're just like, who knows how the kind of business this is going to do. It's not, it's not our responsibility or our concern. Mm -hmm. If it's a big hit or not, that's for the marketing guys. Um, we just want to make a good movie. And we, yeah. I think Shrek was, was fun. I mean, it was, it, it was, we knew that it was funny. It's like, you know, we're making a comedy. How about that? You know, it has some, it has heart, but it's also just a comedy. And I think we were entertained working on it and watching it and seeing the stuff that, that all the other story guys were coming up with, you know, the first animation that we saw was, oh, you know, cause it was CG and the CG. Wow, man, back in 19, whenever it was released 19 was it 2000 or 19 2000, 2000 or 2001 is when it was released. yeah I believe it was it was a cg back then particularly at dreamworks it was our first cg movie man it was tough yeah. to look at i was like oh my god what so at first it was kind of like oh, i hope this doesn't take away from all the fun that we that the story guys had and the writers had come up with but it didn't matter i mean the, the story stands on its own and and uh you know, um, but, but like I said, I think we just sort of felt it was going to be a funny movie. And it was it certainly was different from how it wasn't originally. Um, so I just think we felt yeah, this is this feels like a fun movie. It, it's entertaining for us as a, you know, we're we're also an audience. Mm -hmm. You know, we laugh at stuff. We just look at these storyboards and we're laughing at certain things at work. You know, so it's like we're, we're an audience also. So we just sort of felt this is really funny. Who knows what's what it's going to do kind of business wise, but we know it's a funny movie. So we'll see what happens. And of course, it was a huge hit. Save the studio, literally. Yeah. Uh, won an Academy Award. So there you go. And it's got almost five movies. I know there's a fifth one that's been announced. So they're just going to keep, they don't, they don't know when to quit. But the first one's, I think, the best one. Absolutely. I don't think the animation's the best. I think the animation gets better and better and better as the shows go on. But we told the story. The story was told. There didn't need to be, I mean, I'm not going to, of course, and it made so much money. You want to keep doing that. It's a franchise. Of course, you're going to want to. But I mean, just from a from my standpoint, that first one, everything works. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I ran into Eddie Murphy. You know, who did the who did the donkey's voice? Uh, you nonchalantly uh, said, you know. So I ran into Eddie Murphy here. Like this is a. Well, I've seen him a few times <laughs> over the years. You know, we've talked to. You know, we're not friends or anything, but I've seen I've seen yeah. him. A few. Anyway, so I remember at the Oscars one year we were kind of passing each other and we kind of I started chatting with him I said hey I worked on the you don't remember I know obviously he didn't remember me because I didn't do, have any dealings with him yeah but he, I said I worked on the on the first Shrek I did storyboards on the first Shrek and he goes oh the good one and he, <laughs> says, he kind of keeps walking I'm like all right but I mean I think it is I think it is the the best of the of the bunch yeah. you know I mean there's been, been some other good ones too but I think that first one really feels like it was, it was a fully everything. realized story. I think it really, really still works as a film. Absolutely, man. It encapsulates yeah. everything from start to finish. It is fun. It is hilarious. Yeah. And it's funny. I brought this up with Tom. Uh, you remember seeing that movie, I Am Legend with Will Smith? I don't think I saw it. All right. So uh, I don't want him to know it because he'll take a swing at me. But <laughs> I haven't. Will, I'm going to see it. If you're out there i will i promise i'll see it anyway um no I, I didn't see it so do you know the premise behind it yeah i i, okay. I saw the, the the charlton heston version okay so it's yeah. one of my favorite Omega movies man yeah. oh yeah it's one of my favorite movies of all time yeah it's cool it's, it's a, a great, great story yeah it's a great movie yeah such a great story yeah. um but there's a scene in there where they're actually playing shrek right so yeah. will smith's character he gets fucked up by all the vampires um and then this lady and her kid save him and then take him back to his house so he wakes up and he's in the stupor he doesn't know what's going on he hasn't seen people in two years or whatever it's been and now there is this lady and this kid in his house he flips out he goes upstairs and then he realizes like oh shit this is like the first time i've got people around me i'm being a dickhead i need to go back down so the kid's downstairs and he's watching um he's watching shrek right so you hear shrek going and then will smith is mimicking every single line from eddie murphy and i think it's like the uh the whole i'm gonna build my own swamp or it's, it's one of those yeah, yeah, it's yeah. one of those lines right and then my son is watching me 
watch this movie and I'm laughing, right? And this is, I want to say close to 10 years ago, right? No, way, way, way sooner than that because he's 13. So uh, probably like six or seven years ago, excuse me. Um, so we watched that movie and then we're watching Shrek and I'm doing the same thing that Will Smith was doing. I'm mimicking these lines and he looks over at me and then he's like, you know this movie? And I was like, yeah, man, I saw it when I was a kid. He was like, this movie came out a long time ago. And I was like, movies I'm... back then? Yeah. He's like, calm down. I was like, calm down, Hayden. I mean, this, this movie came out like 10 years ago. It's not that big of a deal. Maybe a little right. bit longer than that. And he was like, man, you're old. And I was like, you son of a bitch. And he's like, I said, he's like six, seven, somewhere around there. But I was like old. And I was like, fuck, man, if I really, if I really become the old guy, I haven't even broke 30 yet at this point. How am I yeah. old? Because I'm quoting Shrek, man. Um, yeah. So that, that was always my core. Anytime I think of Shrek, I think of Will Smith for some reason, the movie. And then I think yeah. of my son calling me old because I've seen this movie. Um, but something that I, I absolutely loved. And uh, have you had fun, Rick? Because we've come to the point where uh, we're going to start asking some fans questions. Oh, yeah, yeah. This is, this is great. Yeah. I would love to have you back on because you've had just looking at your resume, man, you Love have stuff. done, you've done some, I don't have to tell you this, Rick, but you've, you've done some shit. If you didn't realize you've done a lot of cool stuff and you've worked on a lot of cool movies. Um, mostly, so would, mostly cool. Yeah. A, a lot of cool. Stuff. <laughs> I, mean, mo I mean, the movies for the most part are all really good. Yeah. There's a few other projects that were like, yeah, you know, whatever, but I'm, I'm really proud to have worked on some really great movies. So. That's that's good, man. Because I would love to have you back on and sure. to, uh, to to go deeper into your career, man. Because this has sure. been a really fun chat, man. You've been a really great guest. Great, right. uh, cool. But uh, I would be remiss not to ask you, man. Uh, so I gave you those two questions before. So when we when we start to transition to the fans' questions, there's a few like we like to ask. Your Mount Rushmore. And I feel like you've mentioned a couple of those guys already. Oh. So if you had a Mount Rushmore, you have four picks plus one as an honorable mention. Who would be on your Mount yeah. Rushmore? Okay. Um, well, you, I got you. Got to start with Walt Disney mm -hmm. because I mean he was the he's, guy. He's just the, he's just guy. He's just the guy. I mean he what he encapsulated, what he stood for. And the more I know about him, the more I've read about him and heard interviews with him, the more I love him and just respect him and just realize he was one of a kind. There was never will never be another like him. Mm -hmm. So I think Walt Disney for is is number one. Um, these aren't any particular order. Okay. They're just what I'm going to say. Um, Charles Schultz, uh, as a little kid, man, I just so idolized peanuts. And when I got to know him a little better and got to be friends with him and we're both from Santa Rosa, I was, he was, you know, he's, he's in Santa Rosa as I, as did I, and growing up, my parents would be like, well, you know, being a cartoonist is going to be really hard to do. And it's really competitive and it's hard to make a living doing it. But I just kept thinking about that guy up on the hill who, who does peanuts every day. And I'm like, you know what? You're right. But he does it. And I, I want to be like that, you know. So he just had so much integrity. He was a brilliant artist. He stood for so much. I just love his his take on life. Yeah. Um, he was a lot like Charlie Brown. He had this attitude. A lot, Charlie Brown, he would just he'd be very sort of. Um, down on himself sometimes and lack confidence and I'm like wow who doesn't love that who we are all like that We're as great as he was as most successful as successful as he was he still had doubts about himself and his 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 ability and you know he was he really was charlie brown and i think that's why you i think i love him more and love the strip more because he put so much of himself in that strip um and i have to mention bob clampett because bob you know i knew who he was but I didn't know him. And he was the first person I met in animation. And um, he helped me get my first job. You know, I, 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 I met him up in San Francisco at a, at a convention, a science fiction convention. I said, I'm going to move to L.A. pretty soon. Can I take my bring my portfolio to you? I made, I made, a, I made a film in art school and I got some drawings and stuff. And he goes, yeah, yeah when you get down, call me and, and come to the studio and we'll look at your stuff. So that's what happened. And he really loved my work because you're 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 doing this is really great stuff. He says this film that you did, this is better than some of the guys who are in the business right now could do. He says you really have a lot of a lot of future. He says I think you're you have a big future. You know that's so and, cool. And so he invited me to his his place, and he I come to family things and Christmas parties and met all these you know back this is back in 1979. So I met these famous famous animators, you know, and Grim Network and. Harmon and Ising and all these guys who are Virgil Ross, who are all legends, you know. Um, 
And so he was just, he took me in like I was a son, you know, he treated me that way. And I, you know, I just so, so loved him and he was such a great guy. And I got to know him really, really well over the few years and he died in 1984. So it seemed too short. You know, he wasn't, we were, wasn't around a long time, but he, those, those times we spent together, um, Milt Gray was also instrumental in, in, was at Filmation, who helped me get this job. Anyway, my career, I really owe my career, the start of it to Bob Clampett. And then of course I got to know the family and Sodi and, and, and all the kids and, we're still very close and uh boy oh, do i feel lucky to have met him and know him and i just still i still love him to death mm -hmm. um i'll show you something really quick that he's that he gave me i don't know if it's gonna reflect but there's a oh that's so get, cool trying to get that. i don't know if you can read it yeah it's just uh, god this, this flat this reflection's horrible anyway we're seeing a 14 karat future you know, so cool. uh, Bob Clint to Rick, Bob Clint. But anyway, um, the other guy I'm going to mention is one of the nine old men. And there you could pick any of the nine old men and they were the, all the greatest. My personal favorite is John Lounsbury. Yeah. Um, I used to when I started at Disney, I would go. I just loved that. He not only was a brilliant draftsman, but he also did really funny stuff. He did great acting, great performance, but also really funny. And so I would Xerox, I'd go down to the morgue, it's called the morgue back then, the Animation and Research Library, and take out scenes. And this is back in the days you could just take scenes out of, out of the, the library and take them back to your room and have them, you know? And I would, I Xeroxed probably 20 of his, of his scenes, you know, I still have them. I still have, I have some original drawings of his too. But not only was he a great animator, but just a great person. Mm -hmm. And the more I hear about him, the more I love, idolize him. I just, I would have, would have, very unassuming. He got along with everybody. Everybody loved him. He had no, he was very humble. Um, a real quick story I'll tell you about him was um, he was about to be moved upstairs to be a director on uh, The Rescuers. Uh, he had these really good ideas on some sequences. And I said, well, Wooly said, you need to come up here and, and be a co-director and he's like, I am. And John, John was one of those guys where he just did what, you know, what, the, what they wanted him to do. He was a, you know, a team player. Mm -hmm. So he was packing up all of his stuff to go upstairs and Dale Bear walked into his office and said, oh, you, are you excited to go back, go upstairs and direct? And he says, oh, well, you know, not really. So that's what they want me to do, but so I'll do it. He says, he says, but really, he says, all I really wanted to be is a good animator. I thought, oh my God, this guy's like one of the greatest of all time. But he's like, I just want to be a good animator. Yeah. He just felt he has he felt he wasn't there yet. You know, he felt he still had more to do. So that kind of humble attitude is something that I think is really impressive and um just something to admire, you know. So I th those guys I think are I think about those guys a lot. The those four guys. When I'm in, when I'm working, um, and uh, they they remain, uh, they're all you know they're all gone, but they remain influences on me. So you get so, one more as an honorable mention. I'm gonna pick my wife Christy because yeah. she can she inspires me. She she inspires me to be better, a better human, a better artist a great husband, a great everything, you know, and, and when she came into my life, everything went turned around and got great almost immediately. And every day with her is just a blessing, you know? <clears throat> anyway, so I'm going to put her up there. I'm not, and she belongs up there. So uh, uh, absolutely. And she, because she continues to inspire me every day and we, we do projects together. Um, we have a thing called full moon, full moon cartoons that we do together. So anyway, she's got to be up there because she really inspires cool. me. Yeah. That's really cool, man. I'm glad you brought up one of the nine old men. Uh, this one's oh, yeah. always been my favorite. Uh, I mean, Mark Davis is. Oh yeah, the Mark Davis uh, book. Yeah, I have that too. Yeah, yeah it's it's it's. I I was. I would I would yeah I would recommend people that that are interested in anima interested in animation. There's two or three books on the nine old men, mm -hmm. um, and they're get get one get one of them because they're all they're all great and they show really good examples of their work and some of them they talk about their approach frank and ollie of course were still around when i joined the studio and we had many lectures by those two guys mark davis eric uh, eric larson uh ward kimball they would be around a lot and they would answer our questions and 
we used to call in to look at our films, you know, and I remember this, I'll never forget this one thing. This is pretty incredible. We were, you know, we'd always bring them in to get their notes. What do you think of what we're doing? And they'd come in, they'd say, well, you know, this, 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 this. So I remember one time we had a screening of uh, Little Mermaid. You know, we were coming near the coming near the end. I mean, maybe half of it was animated. We invited Ward to come in and take a look at it, see what he thought. And he watched it and it was over and they, we were like, oh, what do you think? You know, can, couldn't wait to hear what his, his words of wisdom were. And I remember him turning back and he goes, he goes, what do you care what us old farts think? He says, you guys obviously know what you're doing. He says, what, you know, what do you care what we have to say? Just keep doing what you're doing. Something like that. I mean, and I was like, wow. Because <laughs> it was like, it's like, you don't need us anymore. You it's guys all the validation have, right there. Yeah, you're, 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 you're making your own path. Yeah. You're forging your own path. You're you're creating these films. They're your version of, of a Disney film. Just keep going. I thought that was pretty incredible. That's nah, a beautiful story, man. Thank you for sharing that one. Yeah. Uh, and the <clears throat> last one before we get to the fans' questions, man. Uh, you got two books that you should tell oh. every animator or every fan okay. of animation they should for sure have on their shelves. What's All right. Here's one. This is the Bible. Mm. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, the Illusion of Life by Frank and Ollie. It's got, I've got, I have, I have like clippings and, you know, all kinds of stuff in here. Auto, it's autographed by them. So who else is in here? I don't, I've had autographed by three or four guys. This, you can't go wrong with this. These are the guys who created animation as we know it. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying this is the only book you need to get, but I think you need to start with this because it's, oh, yeah. This is sets you off on the right path as, as far as not only the nuts and bolts of animation, but the philosophy behind inter, good entertainment and good characters that live. They kept hammering it into us. You guys have got to create characters that live. You don't, I'm not, let's not be so concerned about moving things around and timing and things like that. These characters have to live. They have to believe, be believable. Um, an audience has to watch your work and believe that that character really exists. That's the challenge. And he said, you guys, I remember uh, Eric Larson saying, you guys have a big responsibility because you guys, you guys are Disney. You, Walt Disney, that name that appears before the movie, you have a lot of responsibility to make these films live and breathe and touch an audience. He says, more than any other studio in the world, you guys have have a responsibility because we because it had this history you know disney has this history and what people expect and he says you guys have got to keep that up you know you have to keep keep that keep that quality up so anyway that's the um and then where's the other one ah i can't find it Shoot. oh now i don't know where it is i just had it anyway it's the it's the, the richard williams book yes the, the animators uh that handbook, i think it's called yeah. Um, anyway, that's a great book. It's, it's, it's more about the nuts and bolts of animating, uh, you know, and he's got, he goes over everything multiple times. It's, it's kind of blows your mind. There's so much information in it, but if you get those two books, those are what you should start with. And then there's other great books too. I have lots of friends that have written books on animation and wow, there's just so much. When I was, when I was growing up, there was nothing. The only book there was this Christopher, Christopher Finch book. You know, I think it was just the art of Disney animation. And it was mostly a lot of artwork. There was, there was a lot of text also, but it was mostly a lot of great artwork. And that was, I used to read that book over and over and over again. Um, anyway, that was, that was the only book that was around when I was a kid that was about Disney animation, you know? I've got so that. anyway, there's all the, like I said, there's a lot more sample examples now of other books you can get, but I think those two. Um, I would really recommend still, even though they're, they're pretty old, <laughs> but they're still great. They're for sure the foundation you need. And I have that art of Walt Disney book. It's around here somewhere. Yeah. I'll fucking find it as soon. It has as a wooden, it. it's got like a wooden Mickey mouse on it. Yeah. At least the one I had, it was an original, uh, it had yeah. pla this plastic cover that got ripped up, but had this, this wood Mickey mouse glued to the front of the yeah. book, the original, uh, pressing of that or print of that. All right. And then, uh, like I said, ladies and gentlemen, those two books he just gave you, that is the perfect foundation for any fan of animation or any person that is 
in animation that wants to better their craft. Uh, yeah. Those two are always recommended for the most part, and there's a reason why. Um, <clears throat> so one question we started implementing here uh, not too long ago, it's a fun question because it's, uh, it always, it's interesting to see who you guys throw out there. Um, but it's the animation recommendation for the week, man. So at the end of the episode, we always ask, who do you think? If you guys had fun on this podcast, who do you think we should reach out to? And who would you suggest or recommend they you would think would have a great time on this show as well? You got an animation recommendation for us that we should reach out oh, to? Oh, wow. Um, whew, that's a good one. I mean, I don't know who you've had, you know, uh, or haven't had. Um, gosh, that's a really good question. Well, I think of somebody today who's doing really great things today, um, Jorge Gutierrez. Oh man, I've had Jorge. He's on my Mount Rushmore for sure. He's yeah, such he's, a great he's dude. He's a great dude. Yeah. Been around, yeah, he's been around a little while. He's been around longer than you think. Yeah. But he's a just a wonderful guy, great artist. Beautiful human. Nicest guy in the world. Yeah. I, I love Jorge. Um his book of life has made me cry more than almost yeah. any movie. That movie yeah. completely and changed the, my perception. And the new, Maya, Maya and Maya and the three. Maya in the in the three or Maya and the four. Yeah, Maya. And the secret. The sequel can be my end, the three, my end, the four, my end, the five, six, seven. It's going forever. There it is. Yeah. And it's great. That's a great series. Part of, oh, yeah. It's a. I was supposed to. We, we, were ta- we had talked about me doing animation for him um, early on in that project that was just starting, <laughs> doing some test, 2D test animation for it. And then all of a sudden they said, oh, we, the budget's not going to, we can't allow that. Yeah. I mean, we can't allow that. So we didn't, I didn't do any. Anyway. Um, but he's great. I love Jorge. So yeah, he, he like I said, he he is on my Mount Rushmore, and uh, maybe you can get some work over on Aichiwawa. He's still working over at Netflix on that show right now. Yeah, so I t- we we stay in touch. Yeah, Who knows? you know, we stay in touch. It'd be so nice. You, that's my recommendation. Um, have you had James Baxter on? I have not. No, I have not. Let me write. Okay, that's name. a great. He's great. He's yeah, definitely. I mean, John and Ron, if you can get John, John Musker and Ron Clemens. Um, uh, John Musker is, I've actually been uh, in, in chat with him. He's going to come on a little bit later. Uh, good. He's, he's great. John's great. I've known John forever. He's a great guy. I mean, I owe a lot of my career to him. He's the one that said, okay, we want you to animate. I was doing uh, assistant work on Black Cauldron and mm-hmm. I was doing these personal tests to try to get moved up to animator. And they had just started developing Great Mouse Detective, which is called Basil of Baker Street. And so I said, okay, I'm going to do a test of Basil doing some stuff. And so I had already done a test in Black Cauldron of some stuff that got good, it got a good response. So I was working on my Basil test and John calls me and says, hey, you're going to be a, we're going to move you up to animator on Basil. I said, oh my God, really? Because yeah, so um, I think that was called a junior animator or something like that. But anyway, because you're going to be doing animation. You're not going to be Mike Gabriel's assistant. You're going to be doing your own animation. And I said, what about the test I'm doing? He goes, forget the test. You don't need to be doing a test. You're you're animating now. Anyway, so I I really thank him and and Ron for giving my start as as an animator on Great Mouse Detective. Then we did Little Mermaid and Aladdin. And those guys were absolutely the greatest guys in the world to work with. Always open to ideas. I had a lot of, I came up with gag ideas all the time, of course. And I'd sketch them out and say, hey, what do you think of this? And more often than not, they'd say, yeah, do it. It's funny. It's funnier than what the original idea is. Let's go ahead and do it. So I got to come up with gags that are in the movies. A lot of them are my own shots, but um, with my own character. But th- those guys are the greatest, so. Yeah, you have no idea how hard it's been this entire podcast to not bring up the Great Mouse Detective. That is one of my favorite. Well, you know who's stopping you to bring bring it up? You don't have to well, not bring it up. I, I had a feeling when we were talking because, like I said, the fans' questions were pretty Shrek heavy. Okay. But so I, I wanted to stay on Shrek just to give the fans what they wanted because I knew that if you had fun, that as soon as you said yes to coming back, that it was just going to be all Great Mouse Detective because I can go. Real <laughs> That's okay deep. with me. Yeah. Yeah, I could go real deep on. Like I said, that movie. I remember seeing that movie and I won't go too far and uh, too far off of this and we'll go right into the fans questions, but I remember seeing that movie and rat again, like in the theater. No, 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 no. Cause it came out the same year I was born. Uh, I had this one on VHS. So little mermaid apparently was one of my favorite movies when I was barely one years old. So if I would just having a meltdown as a kid, they would put it in and it would just instantly stop. I'm pretty sure it's because I'm a redheaded dude too. So I'm pretty uh-huh. sure I see a, I see a redheaded person I'm like, Oh, I'm associated. I'm, Pretty sure yeah, I can't imprint go. that on a one-year-old, 
but you know it's seeing something that lo- kind of looks like you or kind of kind of has the same familiarities probably calm yeah. down a little bit but that yeah. one and when i got a little bit older the great mouse detector i have never been more terrified than seeing radigan and fidget together like fidget scared the living shit out of me as a kid <laughs> i absolutely loved it it wasn't until i had an animator on last year uh chris bailey i'm pretty sure you remember i him. love chris yeah one you of know. my dearest friends yes such a cool dude man but yep. he would he was like do you know why you like the great mouse detective i'm like uh it was a good movie i I didn't i didn't know if he was setting me up he's like no dude you liked it because of vincent price in 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 my in my infancy i was like who and he was like dude vincent price radigan i was like i felt like such a fucking idiot when he said i was like dude i know that i just don't understand why i I was tongue-tied because he hit me with one of those questions of hey do you know why you liked it i'm like oh this is this is a setup (laughs) question so i i look like an idiot during that part but nonetheless man I absolutely that was one of my favorite movies of all time like that one is in my top five as far as uh, Disney movies go so uh, for sure we'll be going on that one Um, so we're going to rotate into fans questions and we had quite like I said they were pretty heavy on Shrek Um, so we'll get to as many as we can um, and then just whatever comes to mind uh, we'll we'll, we'll go from there you said there's Aladdin questions too right I believe so I want to say there was at least one or two Aladdin questions It was pretty heavy on Shrek um shrek and then fuck what was the other one uh shit i just lost it shrek and shrek but yeah there was a couple latin questions in here as well um all right so we'll get to the first one uh what antonio mark marquez or marquez so i apologize uh what was your favorite project to work on during your career fully realized or otherwise and what were some of your main influences and inspirations well the influences are pretty much covered, I think, as far yeah. as the, the Idle Men and Bob Clampett. You know, those are the things that are in, in Schultz. I mean, those all work together. Bill Melendez, was, and I forget to mention yeah. Bill Melendez. He was also a great guy when I we hadn't even started. I was trying to figure out what art school to go to. I wrote him a letter through Charles Schultz. Says, he said, I don't, I'm not an anime. He says, write Bill Melendez, who does mm-hmm. all our specials. And I wrote him and he said, come down and I'll, we'll have a, you know, when you're coming down here looking at schools, come and see me and I'll, you know, we can talk. And so my parents and I went and saw him uh, at his studio and he spent about two hours with us yeah. just talking about animation and schools and man, what a great guy. So I love Bill Melendez too. Anyway, uh, those are all those, all those people are my inspirations. Um, what was the other question? Um, yeah, well, what was your oh, favorite project to work on during your career, fully realized or yeah. otherwise? Probably it's always boy. It's always one or two. It's either these one of these two films. Probably Aladdin. Yeah. Um, because I just think Aladdin, when I see it now, I think it holds up the best. Oh yeah. Of any of those '80s, early '90s films that I worked on, I think the I think the way I like to put it is by the time we got to you know we started a lot of us started animating on Great Mouse Detective. That was a lot of our uh, uh, the younger animators. That was mm-hmm. our first film. And then we just, the same group of people went from film to film to film. And I think by the time we did Aladdin, we really knew what we were doing. It oh, yeah. just, I look at the animation and like, yep, it works. Everything works. The story works. The songs are great. It's funny. It's, it's heartwarming without being phony, you know? Mm-hmm. And I just think everything came together in Aladdin as far as, and of course it, it, it has extra um, poignancy, the fact that, Robin Williams passed away, you know, yes. and I think that's a sad, it was such a sad thing, but I think that gives it extra poignance as he, as they fly off and you're like, you're saying goodbye to Robin Williams too, not just the genie. Yeah. So I think, I think it has another layer there. Um, but I, Little Mermaid, I love too. I, I think that really, really, really works. I think some of the animation, including mine, you know, I mean, I wish I could re- redo some stuff. Um, but I think Aladdin, you know, I'm really proud of that film. I think it just works from start to finish. The animation looks great. Eric Gold, Eric Goldberg did some incredible genius. things on the genie. Genius. Duncan Marjorie Banks was the lead on. I worked on Abu, but Duncan was the lead on Abu, and he set the standard of what Abu should look like and how he should move. And he's Duncan did some brilliant work. You know, Glenn on you know did a great stuff on Aladdin, and Mark did great stuff on Jasmine and day approximate on uh, the king and i mean i can go on and on and on but yeah anyway i think aladdin everything everything considered i think aladdin works works the best for me you want to hear my favorite eric goldberg story even though i've never met him what's that 
So should be on your show. He should be on your show. Man, I would love to. Dude, uh, get him. Shit, he's a very hard man to track down. I have his address. He can go to his house. Just park. <laughs> just park outside his house. And when he Come comes on up, my show. <laughs> just, you know. But uh, so when Sketchbook came out a few months ago, I used to I used to want to be an animator when I was younger. Uh, I, I would see something and I would draw and I, would just, I absolutely loved it. And growing up in Orlando, Florida, we've got both Walt Disney World and we have Universal yeah. Studios, right? Yeah. So Nickelodeon Studios fans. I know you're tired of hearing the story, so I apologize. But Nickelodeon Studios was still here at Universal. It was right before they were getting ready to roll out SpongeBob SquarePants, right? Mm-hmm. It's 97, 96, somewhere around there. So we are going through Universal, and this is like one of the only memories I have of my dad. Uh, he went to prison when I was really young. Only memory I really have of him like going and wanting to do stuff with us as, as uh-huh. we were kids. Uh-huh. And uh, so he took us to Universal Studios. And as we're going through the gates, they're handing out tickets. Says, hey, we're getting ready to roll out the show, and we want to show people what we're doing, what we're working on. So I remember we're walking uh, and we're looking down into where the artists are. And it was starting to be a skeleton crew because they were starting to, to move a lot of the animation out to L.A., right? So there's a few artists there. There's a few writers and stuff like that. So as I'm looking down, I'm seeing the artists draw, right? And I'm in the heyday of who are, who are skeletons, as you said. <laughs> so I'm seeing, I'm seeing them draw. And then I kept seeing the one artist over in the corner, he kept tearing shit down, balling it up and throwing it away. And I remember asking the lady to an extent of like, Hey, why does he keep, why does he keep throwing that away? That looks really good. And she's like, Oh, if it's not, you know, the way it's supposed to be, he has to start over. And I was like, well, shit, I'm thinking in my head, I'm like, I'm never going to do this because everything that I draw, my mom says is really good. And she hangs up. So I, I kind of, I kind of <laughs> lost them. I lost the magic there. So I was like, Fuck. Yeah. so that's one thing that I really regret. If I could go back in time, I would really pursue it because just for the first, I want to say from like six to 13, six to 14, that's all I did. I would just see something I would draw. Yeah. I could never really create yeah. anything of my own, but right, I could see right. something and I could do it. So, but yeah, so when I, when I see the sketchbook, right. I hadn't drawn in <clears throat> probably like four or five years. Like I'll draw with my kid, um, my oldest one every once in a while. He's like, dad, you want to draw? I'm like, yeah, sure. We'll give some pens and paper, some crayons and markers and shit out. But I'm watching sketchbook and I'm all by myself, right? Wife and kids are out doing something. Wife probably was at work. Baby was sleeping. I don't know what it was, right? So I was by myself. So I see the Eric Goldberg episode. I'm like, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. whoa. And he's drawing it, right? And his, his joy is so fucking infectious. Yeah. Yeah. His joy, like him, and there's another guy, Sandra Cluzo, that I had on a couple weeks ago. Oh, yeah, Sandra's oh, great, yeah. Oh, phenomenal yeah. guy. Yeah. Um, so I'm watching him, and I absolutely, I instantly pause his episode. I get my car keys, I get my wallet, and I go up to a hobby lobby, like a hobby store. I buy a sketchbook, I buy some pencils, I buy some shit. And I'm going to sit down, and I'm going to draw the genie, with because that's what it made me feel like. Like him... Yeah. Him having that, that was a master class. That's exactly what that episode was with Eric. It was yeah. a master class of him drawing the character, the genie. Robin Williams is my favorite actor of all time. But him getting in there and not missing a beat, nothing was a wasted moment. Nothing was a wasted movement. Every pencil line meant something. So I'm sitting here and I'm drawing along with him. And I want to say about 30, 45 seconds into it, I look at my drawing. I look at his. I look back at mine and I just draw a big X. I close the pad yeah, and then I just hit play and I just start watching the episode. I was yeah. so in like, just his, like I said, his infectious joy for this character, just his love yeah. of Disney animation, his, his, I don't know how to articulate what I'm really trying to say, but just watching him, I was so fucking blown away by somebody that, that, that took this character and this character, like I said, Robin Williams, my favorite actor of all time. Yeah. You know, seeing him that Mrs. Doubtfire, those two movies come to mind right off the bat and just seeing that. And then we talked, I talked a little bit about, I had Nick Ranieri on not too long ago. So oh, Nick great. and I talked, Nick yeah. and I talked about it too, but yeah. just seeing what that man can do with these. Well, Eric is, Eric is so invested mm-hmm. in his characters, in his animation. Um, he, he is also a really big fan of animation. I mean, he yes. loves it. He knows all about it. You know, it's one thing to be, there are some, there are some people who are, they just, they're really good at animating and they're, they're more like fine artists or whatever, but Eric is a fan of animation. He knows all about it. He knows the past. It inspires him and he's completely invested in his characters Mm -hmm. and he can just do stuff that I don't even, I can't even believe, you know, his, his thought process. I think he, uh, he, I think he and Glenn Keen are the same way in the fact that, they have a different plane of existence than the rest of us and they see things differently. 
And they're able, because of that, they're able to do things that we have to sort of struggle to get. And yeah, mm -hmm. man, we throw, we throw bad drawings away all the time. Yeah. Uh, of course, now I'm working on a Cintiq, so I just <laughs> delete, <laughs> circle delete, you know, it but in the I'd be throwing shit. I'd just be throwing crap on the, in the waste, God, ripping it at some You get so frustrated because you can't, the drawing doesn't do what you want it to do. Um, so it's frustrating, but Eric is a, he's a one of a kind guy. Absolutely. And, um, um, I have a funny, not a funny story, but it's a kind of a moving story. Speaking of Robin Williams, I'll make it really quick. Um, I was, oh, I, do a lot of I do a lot of comic conventions. Okay. And I was doing the LA, whatever the hell it's called. Um, this is a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And, uh, this young woman came to my table and she was looking at my stuff and all my drawings and you know, sign stuff and do drawings for people and all my characters. And she's looking at him and my wife, Christy's telling her, Oh, this is Rick Farmel. And he did blah, 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 blah. And she goes, I know, she goes, I know who he is. She goes, Oh yeah, I know who he is. And she goes, Oh, okay. She goes, I think she goes, I have some of his stuff on my wall at home mm, cells or something like that. So she's like, Oh, okay. So, she comes to me and starts, and so I kind of start talking to her. And I said, yeah, I worked on Aladdin and I did a boo. I, drew, I animated a boo. And she goes, yeah, I know. We, yeah. She's like, just kind of, stand, I'm kind of wondering, it's kind of a odd, she wasn't like, oh gosh, can you draw, do me a drawing? She wasn't doing that. She was just kind of listening to me. Mm -hmm. And she said, yeah, I know who you are. And then she says, well, she said, my dad was the genie. Wow. And at so first, at first it didn't register. I'm like, oh, oh, you mean your dad drew the genie? I was sort of thinking, and then I'm realizing, and she's, I'm like, but I know Eric's daughters and you're not one of Eric's. And I'm just kind of, I'm saying, I'm like, oh my God, you're Robin's daughter. And she says, yeah, he was my dad. I'm like, oh my God. And what I had was that she was looking at it for such a long time was I did a drawing when he passed away. I was working at a studio and I just did a drawing of Abu with his hat off. Mm -hmm and his head down and looking at the lamp that was open and empty yeah. and just it just said by genie that's all it said and i signed you know i just did it as a little tribute and i posted it on facebook and dude everybody somehow got a hold of it and they were sharing it all over and i came in i just around midnight i put this thing just a little that's all i did just a drawing of a boo with this thing and this yeah. little tear and it had gone viral, you know, overnight. And I came in the morning and people, hey, I love your drawing of a boo. I'm like, what are you talking about? Oh, it's all over. It's on uh, Instagram and blah, everything. Anyway, but I had, so I did a color version of it, you know, kind of really nice color version. And that's what she was looking at. And she was yeah. like, yeah, it's, that's my dad. And I'm like, oh my God, you got to let me <laughs> sign this. He goes, no, it's okay. No, please. It's, so I gave it to her and signed it. We got a picture together and stuff. But I just thought that was so sweet that she came by and, you know, just was very unassuming, but just sort of said, oh yeah, I, I know who you are. And just looking at that drawing, little tribute drawing I did for her, you know, about her dad. Anyway, it was pretty, very emotional to talk about. And it was emotional when it happened, but boy, I felt so lucky. Yeah, that happened. You know? I can imagine. I mean, I, I can't remember what day he passed. It was either the 12th or the 14th, but my birthday is on August 13th. Um, so I remember taking a nap. And like I said, when we were talking earlier, you remember where you are at specific points in time sure, in your life. Yeah. I was taking a nap. I was laying on the couch. I was still in Norfolk, Virginia. I was, it was shore duty, right? So I was taking a nap. And then uh, I, I remember, and I don't ever watch the news. The news is fucking depressing. And sure as shit, the one time I want to go turn on the fucking news, I see the CNN scroll by it says Robin Williams dies or passes away. Yeah. And I remember, and I'm like, am I awake? Did I wake yeah, up? Is this a, is this a nightmare? Cause the man was my hero. The man is still my hero. Like I, like it took me quite a few years to, to watch my favorite movie of his, which is Mrs. Doubtfire. Like that movie made me fall in love with that man. As far as an actor go, like there was no better actor in my eyes than Robin yeah. Williams. He was yeah. the greatest of all time. Yeah. And then I see this and then I'm just like, this, this can't be, I, I like, I'm, I'm, I can imagine like everybody felt the same way. Like yeah. 
there was nothing funny about anything for a long time for me. Like I, I, it, it took, it took my smile, man. It really did. And it wasn't until I can't remember who I was talking to, but it, it probably been like two or three years after he passed. And anytime a movie came up, like anytime a movie came up before, I don't give a fuck what, what it was. It could be the birdcage. Yeah. It could be good morning, Vietnam. It could be yeah. Mrs. Stout. It didn't matter what part of what movie it was. We were watching it. Yeah. Anytime after I, I would just kept going. Yeah, I get it. Remember, well, you know, I think I think the thing that was shocking to to mo- I mean, we you know, we got to meet him mm-hmm. uh at the rap party at seven. He was like so friendly and so cool and so nice, and he was so full of life. He just so full of life that it's hard to imagine yeah. that that would be extinguished somehow. You know, it's like, how could that soul, you know, yeah. be quelled, be be silenced you know it was just shocking it took yeah it took you a while to kind of for it to sink in and register like what had happened and you know of course he had been was going through a lot of really rough stuff oh, yeah. and and you know physical illnesses and stuff and so you know it was it was a it was pretty traumatic for a lot of us who now i'm, I'm i certainly can't couldn't say i knew him i didn't i mean i yeah. just met him all the time but, you know, I think John and Ron probably, you know, who got to work with this dude, we would, I told uh, his daughter this, I said, we used to watch your dad's videos. Mm-hmm. I said, even though he wasn't my character, whenever they'd come back from a recording session, we'd sit down and watch his performance because it was so incredible. And I said, your dad inspired us, even though, even though, you know, he was not my character or these other guys' characters, his performance inspired all of us to try to do great animation and, and put forth a great performance from our characters because he was so big and so full of yes. life and he just jumped off the screen. We were trying to kind of, well, what can we do to make our characters yeah. that big, you know, and, and come up with that kind of a performance. So he really inspired us to, to do great work, you know, and I think she really liked hearing that, that, that even though I, yeah, I wasn't, I didn't animate the genie, but man, we, I sure used his energy yeah. And was inspired by his energy to try to put forth, you know, in my character, what I could, you know. Absolutely, man. And like yeah. I said, man, that was, it, it was tough for sure, man. And uh, he's greatly missed. Yeah. Um, uh, so we got some uh, fans questions here. Uh, did people really, uh, I took a screenshot of this one, so I didn't get the whole name. Uh, did people really look at the Shrek job as scrub work? Uh, they had <laughs> no idea. Some of these are a little bit harder to read. Um, I, I have a lot of fans that are from overseas as well. Um, so English is not their first language. So um, yeah. bear with me here. Uh, they had no idea it would blow up as big as it did. Um Obviously, we, we touched on that just a little bit because you never yeah. you just want to make a good movie. You never know. We yeah we as far as scrub work or whatever. Um, you know, like I said, there was a time when it was just sort of like the Lost Project. Like, oh, if you want to get fired, go work on Shrek because you're not going to be here long. If you want to be a director, if you want to be a director who wants to be replaced, go work on Shrek because you'll be you'll be there about two months. And then you, I mean, it was like teams, four or five yeah. teams of directors, you know. Not and these guys are all amazingly talented guys. The, these guys they had directed other things and they were great, but there's something about that Shrek nut they couldn't crack, you know. Um, so we were just like, oh, you know, we it was kind of almost a forgotten project for a while until Jeffrey decided we're gonna do this thing. He just believed in it, you know, and he says, We're gonna let's go and we're gonna make this. And there you go. He knew. Oh, oh boy, did he know? He um the Metal Mewtwo 9001 wants to know. And I don't know how factual this one is, but how do you feel about Shrek's resurgence of popularity through social media? I feel like Shrek's always been present. I didn't know that it, it's one of those things that just kind of never goes away. I mean, yeah, it's like herpes. It's part, it's part, yeah, it's part of pop, pop culture where it's just sort of always there. You know, I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot worse things for people to remember than Shrek. I'll tell you that they're oh. still around, you know, um, some things you just wish would go away, but they don't. But Shrek is one of those things where I think people were inspired by his character and he was an under an underdog and obviously an ogre, you know, not a, you know, not a, a glamorous character and he prevailed and I think that's what people latch on to it's like oh you know they relate to that that underdog thing you know I think the fact that he's still around and they there's still properties being done with him mm-hmm. it's just it's it's his universal appeal that is it's successful, you know? 
He's got layers, man. He's got layers. He's got layers like you, like an onion, yeah. <laughs> Dazzling Red Dress wants to know, uh, what did it feel like when Shrek won the first Best Animated Feature at the Oscar? Oh, it was amazing. Yeah. Um, I was a, I was a, a member of the Academy. Did I, I must have gone to that Oscars. I, I went to so many. I probably did go to that. Do you guys get to vote if you're if you're a part of the academy? Yeah. And your movie's up. Do you? Yeah, get you to vote. vote. You vote. Yeah, you vote. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it, it's it's uh, the, it's it's all the preliminary voting is a little bit different, but I mean, once they get the final ballot, you vote on everything. Okay. So, and I don't even know what Shark was up against that year, but um, we were just thrilled. I mean, it was like I mean, you, you know, you, you just kind of don't believe it. You know, the mm-hmm. very first animated best animated film Oscar was Shrek. That'll always be a great trivia question. And Jeffrey was so proud. I mean, we were all proud that, that, you know, it was, that it was, that it won. And I think we all felt great for Jeffrey because he really believed in the project and for him to, for him to be able to get that Oscar, it was so deserved. And, and, you know, what was cool about it was, which wasn't, you know, I, by that, by the time the Oscars were, had come out, I had left. I was at, at Klasky Chupa working on a Rugrats movie but we ended up with the movie, you know, Shark was a big hit. We ended up getting bonuses. He just sent bonuses to us. Well, that's cool. Out of nowhere. I'm like, what? what's this check for? And I forget how much it was. This is probably a couple grand or something, but he didn't have to do that. But he yeah. got, we got bonuses, which I thought was great, you know? So anyway, um, we were all really proud that it, that it won and, and certainly for Jeffrey, happy for him. And yeah, I'm happy for Vicky and Vicky and Andrew, who did a great, great job directing it. They were great leaders and incredibly supportive and we we're really happy for them yeah they cracked that code man you guys really knocked they out sure of the park sure and then did. uh I, I pulled it up what they were up against that year um jimmy neutron boy genius was which one of my favorite shows uh, on nickelodeon studios and monsters inc from disney pixar man uh-huh. so you guys beat out you guys beat out disney pixar that was a tight tough, yeah beating powers. pixar is hard just particularly in those days yeah, you ain't lying, man. Even now, dude, it's just like a Pixar movie. You're like, oh, shit, they're going to tear at my heartstrings here. Um, <laughs> I don't know if this guy might know you or uh, he's just uh, playing on something you might have said a little while ago, but Super Dash Robo wants to know, how you doing? Absolutely great. Beautiful. That's how um, I'm doing. No, it's, it's fun. To, it's fun to do this. So I'm always I always feel like I'm in my element doing this. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. Shrek Storybook wants to know, is the rumor about Shrek's face being inspired by French wrestler Maurice Tillette actually true? I've never heard of that dude, so I'm going to say it's not true. I mean, it could be, but I think, I mean, I look at the original design and it's close to the book, the mm-hmm. way the book looks. I mean, we obviously made, you know, changes to the way he looked in the book. I don't think he was modeled after anybody in particular. Sometimes Jeffrey will will use the live action guys uh, mm. and, and women to inspire and maybe, you know, he always wants everything to look like Tom Cruise, you know, but not this time. <laughs> he didn't pick up. We didn't see a photo of Tom Cruise next to the drawings. <laughs> so uh, not this time. I, I don't think it was inspired by anybody in particular. I think it's a conglomeration of different different people and different influences. I could be wrong, but I think that's, you know, how it was done hey man i'm gonna take your word because you were there man uh mr cthulhu wants to know uh and he had underneath that onions have layers uh what was the most difficult thing in any film you've done to animate you got one one or two that sticks out oh difficult wow um i usually was able to to do one thing was really difficult because I think because I didn't have very much experience at the time I had to do a in Great Mouse Detective I had to do a scene of Toby running and he ran parallel to the camera and then he did then he turned and he was three quarter rear running from the camera that's inc- that's impossible a dog running four legs three quarters from the camera and and then profile and turning and all I mean I had to do that and that was really hard and I was a beginning anime, so it was really hard. And I just kept doing it and doing it and doing it. And I thought it, I thought it looked pretty good. And then when the when I saw it later, they had put later they put a fence with <laughs> slats in the where he's running. I'm like, oh, they hid him behind. Okay, whatever. Oh. So they got kind of got around it, but I felt kind of like, oh, well, you know, uh, that was 
you know, that was difficult. I don't know why there's probably other things that have come to mind that are difficult. They were more, certainly more complicated. That just was a hard thing to draw. Um, it's such a non-confrontational way of covering something up too. <laughs> you just put bushes in front of it. Yeah, you know, it's still there, but there's all, you can barely, oh, is there, oh, there's a dog. Oh, there he is. You know? So they were, they were clever about hiding my, uh, my week animation. Oh man, I love it. And uh, last, <clears throat> excuse me, last one here. Uh, what was your favorite scene with the boo to animate? Do you have one that sticks out, one or two? Well, how about, how about we take this question a little bit further? What was your favorite scene that you got to animate with a boo? And what was your favorite scene that you didn't get to animate with a boo? You got one or two. <laughs> well, I don't think about the ones I didn't get to do. Um, <laughs> gosh, I. <sighs> I can't, I, you know, when he was the elephant was really fun. Him turning into the elephant, that was really fun. I did most of him as the elephant. Mm -hmm. um, I think Abu up on the uh, roof with Aladdin and Jasmine, when he does that, he's I thought that looks pretty good. And then when he's yelling, when he's pointing at her, and he's, there's a few of them in there and that sequence that I really like. I thought those turned out really, you know, they turned out the way I wanted them to. So I like, there's a few of those that I thought were successful. They did what I wanted them to do. Um, the elephant, I'll tell you a really quick story about the elephant. Um, after he's, you know, I did the elephant, he turns into the elephant, which is fun. That secret, when just the yeah. trunk goes out in the ears, that was just really fun. And then he walks in the parade, got to do that. That was fun. Kicks the door open. That was fun. And then after that, you don't see him. He's the elephant and he, he can't he can't go anywhere anymore. He's stuck, right? So there's a scene of Aladdin and, ja uh, and, and the genie kind of in the jungle and they're talking about Jasmine. And there's a boo as the elephant stuck in the corner and he's, you know. And so John says, just have him, he said, just keep him alive. Just have him breathing or looking or just something subtle. I'm thinking, damn it! He's like, you need. He's not even in the movie anymore. So I was trying to think of something to come, a thing to come up with where he would do something. You know, I want to keep him in the movie, you know. So I had an idea of. I said, John, I had this idea. What if he still thinks he's a monkey, and he's trying to peel bananas, and he's just always. He, but he's got this and that hands. He's just got these hooves or whatever those elephant feet are called, and he's just squishing the banana and throwing the bananas over his shoulder. And there's a pile of bananas off to the side and john said okay yeah that's funny do that so i went to, back to my desk and i started to do but it was a little like this mm -hmm. and then i saw but then john told me he says no 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 want, we're gonna make that a scene we're gonna cut to that so do it big we're gonna make that actually a gag in the movie so do them big and do all and then we're gonna we'll pan over and there'll be a bunch of banana skins over on the thing anyway so that that's what happened and so when you see the movie the only reason that him peeling bananas is because I had to try to come up with some way to keep him in the movie because he wasn't hardly in it anymore. Anyway, that's being invested in your character. So talk uh, about thinking on your feet too, man. That's such a great uh, scene. I just thought it would be, you know, I had a lot of these funny ideas that he could do and, and some of them they liked, some they didn't, but that one they liked. And, and so I was able to, that's one of my favorites just because I, you know, I kind of made it, made it up, you know, I, I, I got to do my idea, you know, and also let me show you this. This is cool. I think they had these at, I think they had these at Target or something. I saw these online, but they actually did a little. Oh, that's so cool. Isn't that friggin' crazy? And, yeah. and he's got his, look at that. He's got his tongue hanging out. I remember doing his little, eh, little tongue hanging out when he was. What's that feel like? That's my exact drawing, man. That's my exact drawing. What, is, what does that feel like? Obviously, you, you're immortalized in that movie with that scene, but Crazy. you start seeing something like a toy or you see a It blows my mind. The other thing that blew my mind was, I'll show you this real quick. They did, you know, these pops, right? Oh, Funko yeah. Funko pops. Okay. Yeah. So this one comes out. I have the, there's a Naboo one of him, is the monkey and the elephant, which I was thrilled about. But they did this one of Scuttle. And he's holding his dingle hopper, which was my scene. And I'm like, damn it, man. They they picked my my scene of him with the dingle hopper to do a toy of. That's so and cool. The, re the reflection's kind of screwed up. But he's got his little, he's holding it. That's Isn't so that cool. crazy? Anyway, so I was very proud of that, that he did a Funko Pop with a, with a boo uh, with the dingle hopper. Anyway, 
man well like i said rick <laughs> it's been a lot of fun i can't wait to do this again uh if sure if uh fans want to come by and say hey rick man i like that thing you did that one time where can they come and find you on the old social media oh i thought you're gonna have them come to my house and like I oh mean, boy if you if you want them to you can i mean no you know you can if you you can find me on facebook that's the easiest thing to do just okay. you know i'm not gonna i'm not gonna friend everybody probably okay. but you can certainly get to me on facebook and send me a message if you want absolutely man and like i said any links that you want in there we'll put them in here if you got an art page yeah. website a book you got coming out no problem you guys can go and i do right and, below and i can do i mean i've done commissions and stuff for people um you can always write me at my email address which is rfarmalo1 at gmail.com um i did be, i do care you know like i said i do commissions and stuff and drawings and whatever if, but if you have questions you can just write me and you know i'm pretty good about getting back to getting back to people so absolutely man well rick like i said this has been an absolute pleasure for me i can't wait to do it again great mouse yeah. detective. we'll do a two part or not a two part excuse me we'll split it between two we'll do great mouse detective because i really want to talk about that one and as well sure. as aladdin because there's a lot of questions i had about aladdin that i want to ask you um okay. but uh he's been rick man i've been julian this has been a what's in my head podcast and this has been another piece of your childhood good night my guest next week is legendary director for The Simpsons, Mark Kirkland. Enjoy the teaser. My friend Tuck Tucker, but I have to sadly say to the late Tuck Tucker. Yes, unfortunately, yeah. He, 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 I brought him on to The Simpsons. I had worked with him before, and he was my one of my top animators. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but I would give him really almost slapsticky scenes, a little bit like Homer, you know, with the oar pounding on the on the fish, trying to kill the fish, stuff like that. And Buck uh, is was from West Virginia, so he had kind of a country country uh, country boy enthusiasm about fishing and stuff like that. So he was perfectly cast for doing stuff with Homer like that. And, yeah. Uh, but his animation just sparkled. And uh...